have a conversation about. About the fact that you're my dad. It's hard to write them off. Give it some time. I'm sorry that your father has not been a part of your life. He is the one who has missed out. Morning, Swiftness. Morning, Lady Temeraire, Cameron, Nix, Erica. I, I remembered this time. <laughs> hey, Vale. Uh, I'm awake and here as well. And what more can we expect from ourselves and from each other in these unprecedented times? <clears throat> Whoa. 
What do you bet somebody makes a movie? Or writes a book? These unprecedented times about COVID. <laughs> oh, I, 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 that's a lot of effort for anybody to put in, um, Cameron, I think, I think we're good. Bup, 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 bup. So my voice got thrashed from recording two chapters yesterday. <laughs> if it were a drinking game to take a drink every time somebody says unprecedented, we we're all going to die. Right? It's like that whole thing of watching like old pandemic movies and being like, where's all the, uh, where's all the deniers? Where's all the, where's all the people, you know, <laughs> like future zombie movies are going to be so freaking annoying having to. Having to watch all the characters who sit there and try to pretend it's not happening. Yeah, exactly, Vale. <laughs> oh, and humanity banded together to stop the spread? Really? Did they? You sure that's what happened? <laughs> uh, yeah. Alright, so I'm going to try to do one chapter. To, well, actually, let me let me look at one thing real quick. Yeah, we're going to do one chapter today. Chapter 7 is a chunky one. 4,200 words. Oof. Bing bong. So, we'll do that and then we'll give our... We'll give my poor voice a rest. Okay, sound booth microphone on.
Okay. Yeah, you gonna be good, audition? All right, Yaren, recording day five, starting as always with 30 seconds of silence, beginning now. All right. <laughs> oh, that's good, Nix. Chapter 7 Yerin, Chapter 7 Lauren did her level best to fulfill Uzo's request, doling out precious gold to fill him with fine Kalentin wine during their midday meal. Uzo drank deep and often, while Annis tittered and Jem shook his head ruefully. Uzo had not often complained during their journey, but as the wine set in, he began to make long-suffering remarks about his fate. "'Am I to blame for the way I look?' he said, his words slurring slightly. "'I only ever sought to be a warrior, yet all my life lechers have eyed me like a mountain to be climbed.' "'That is mayhap an unfortunate metaphor,' said Shion. "'But come now. I know you had lovers on the seat. You have never wanted for fine company. Uzo slumped over the table and shrugged. I suppose I have had my share of good companions in my time, yes. There, you see, said Shion, smiling as she sipped her wine. Do not look so morose. We all honor your great sacrifice in the name of the High King. Lauren and Annis chuckled. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh yeah, my uh my throat is still definitely a little bit like you sure about this, buddy? You sure this is what we want to be doing right now? Have you thought this through? Uzo's scowl deepened, and he pushed his chair back from the table. I suppose I have had enough fun poked in me. I shall go and get this over with. Farewell, said Jem, who had not looked up from his food in some time. Be safe. Uzo gave the boy a small smile. He ruffled Jem's hair before walking away. I shall. Best to put the matter from your mind, little master. Jem's head came up, and he watched the mystic go. Then he lowered his chin to rest on his folded arms again, looking a little less forlorn. There was little to do until Uzo's return. They went to their room after they had finished eating, and there Lauren and Annis sat discussing the map while the others rested. Annis read the names of various cities to Lauren and explained some of her thoughts about them, the pieces she had been trying to put together in their search for Damaris. As we traveled, I sometimes wondered if she might be making for Bertram. <clears throat> As we traveled, I sometimes wondered if she might be making for Bertram, said Annis. But I thought that would be folly. Bertram is not the capital, but all the same, the king's law has a strong presence. She would attract notice here, no matter how stealthily she traveled. I might have made sense. It might have made sense.
It might have made sense as a brief way stop before some other destination, but when she began to cut back and forth across the northern countryside, I thought that possibility had vanished. Could it still be possible? said Lauren. We lost her trail in Sidwan. What if she evaded us long before that? What if we pursued her retinue for the last week or so while she made for Bertram and beyond? Annis frowned. Anything is possible, but if that is the case, we have almost certainly lost her. A while later, Uzo returned at last. His jaw was set in a firm line as he quietly entered their room. His clothing was must. When he stopped before Lauren, he gave her a quick salute. I have returned, Nightblade. No need for formality, said Lauren. Do we have what we need? We do, said Uzo. Conjo waits downstairs, there to lead us to while. From the other corner of the room, Shion looked at him with a carefully neutral expression. And did Conjo get what she needed? Annis nearly died. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, it's sex jokes. It's just sex jokes all the way down. <clears throat> Annis nearly died from trying to restrain her giggling, and Lauren hid a smile. Jem looked morose, but Uzo only glared at Shion. Even when it points in a less desirable direction, my spear is still strong. Lauren leaped to her feet and clapped him on the shoulder. And that is all we need to hear about that, I think. Thank you again, Uzo. Now let us go and fetch the moon-eyed smith while she is still amenable. They left Chet in the room again and went downstairs, where they found Kanja waiting for them. A beatific smile played across the smith's face. She draped an arm across Uzo's shoulders and kissed his cheek before nodding warmly to the others. Greetings, all. Let us do our business. It is a fine evening for it. Fine indeed, said Lauren. We are ever grateful for your willingness to make an introduction. Oh, I'm more than willing said Kanja, stroking Uzo's hair. And please accept my earnest wish for many more favorable dealings in the future. Several of the common room's patrons looked at Kanja and rolled their eyes. From the way they muttered into their drinks, Lauren doubted this was the first time they had seen the smith conducting such business. Uzo gave Lauren a weary look. She hid a smile and gestured Kanja out the door. The streets were lit with strange lanterns like Lauren had never seen before. Their sides were made of parchment, not glass, and they were open at the top and bottom, with a small cover a finger or two above the top to keep their flames from falling prey to wind or snow. The paper gave them a warm, soft glow, less harsh than a regular lantern, and it bathed all the streets and walls of the city as they made their way along. There were few dancers or other street performers here, the way there had been on the seat or in Dahab. <laughs> the only thing about voice recording streams is you you get you get all the mouth. You get every burp and every grunt and every bleh. <clears throat> See you next. Have good work. But as the sky above grew darker, some people climbed to rooftop balconies built into many of the houses and shops. There they would stand, leaning on a railing, and sing. The words were in no tongue Lauren recognized, and the tune was unfamiliar, though it sounded old. Then she noticed that the words and the tunes blended together from one singer to the next, with just enough difference to tell they were somewhat different songs. It created an odd sensation as they walked, for the same song seemed to shift and meld into different forms of itself the farther they went. Most of the party looked up at the singers as they went. <clears throat> the 
Most of the party looked up at the singers, mouths hanging open slightly in awe. But Kanja walked as if she did not even notice them, and Lauren supposed that might be true, since she likely heard them often enough. But Shiyun tilted her head back, a pleasant smile tugging at her lips. It was the look of one meeting a friend they had not seen in a long time. Why do they sing? said Jim. His voice was hushed with reverence. It is a farewell to winter, said Shiyun softly. The calendar of Underrealm says that spring has come already, of course, but tradition dictates that they sing it on this night. That custom was built on the fading of the snows, and not the marks of some scholars upon a piece of paper. What luck that we should be here, said Annis, to think that they only sing like this once a year. <clears throat> <clears throat> Oof. Come on, we can do this. Kanja and Shiyun gave a quick snort of laughter together. That is not the case, said Kanja. Soon they will sing the song to greet spring. Then they will sing another song to mark spring's peak, and then another to say farewell to spring, and then another to greet summer, and so on. If you spend any length of time in the great Dorsian cities, you will likely grow sick of all the singing. I do not see how I... <clears throat> I think we had a little background noise there. Yeah. I do not see how I could, said Lauren. I hope I get to hear it again, and often. They reached the point where the two rivers became one and spun away westward. Each current was spanned by a great bridge. In the center of the confluence was a massive pedestal built of unyielding stone, upon which were hung many lanterns. From what Lauren could see, it was crafted out of a rock that had been in the water already. Atop the pedestal was a great statue of bronze, may up six paces tall. She was a woman, that much was certain, clad in armor and with her long flowing hair splayed out in the wind. On her shield was a device of the sun. Rena Sunmane, said Annis with reverence. She resided here in Bertram during the Kinslayer War. She did, said Kanja, but that statue was built a long, long while after those times. Now they say she stands guard over the river boats that wind along the waterways. I myself think she is a great nuisance that too many ships crash into. But who would waste the effort to remove such a large rock from the river, especially when many of the simpler folk nearly worship her? Annis scowled at the smith's back. They crossed to Bertram's eastern district. <clears throat> oh, boy. It's good, though. I think I'm going to... If I keep this up as a daily thing. My voice will probably start getting used to it eventually. That's the hope. <clears throat> they crossed to Bertram's eastern district, built on the wedge of land between the two smaller rivers. Shortly after that, Conja stopped in front of a large building. It looked like a simple shop, but its front door was locked and barred shut. Kanja began to lead them around to the back of the building, but Lauren stopped her, turning to Uzo and Shion. Wait here, she said. I will take... I will take Annis and Jam inside. Only come after us if you hear trouble. Shion nodded, and she and Uzo took position to either side of the alley beside the building. Kanja gave Uzo a little wave as she left. He returned it with a sickly smile. They followed her around the back of the building, where a small door led to an apartment built in the building's rear. She knocked, and soon they heard a voice on the other side of the door. What does while sound like? Hmm. 
shit. What does he sound like? Oh, he appeared in Hellskin, didn't he? Didn't we get, yeah, we gave him a gra gravelly Irish accent. And he's a lot older then, but. <clears throat> Who is that? I can see that, my dear. I am asking about the others with you. No, no, no. Normally, new friends are my favorite people, but recent events have soured me on company. May up another time. And I trust you implicitly, my dear, yet I do not trust them. That is a mighty promise. You do not know how deep my pockets are. And never let it be said that I do not respect confidence, even when that confidence borders on arrogance. Come in, then, I suppose. Greetings to all, and a good evening to you. As Kanja has no doubt told you, I am known as Wile, or likely you knew that already, for I heard that you have been searching for me. But I do not think I know you, or have heard of you, and you are a bit younger than the friends I am used to seeing. Okay. All right. I think we got it. <clears throat> Who is that? Kanja smiled at Lauren and winked. It is Kanja, you rascal. I can see that, my dear. I am asking about the others with you. Lauren looked closer at the door. She could not see a peephole. How could Wiles see them? I have brought some new friends who wish to meet you, for business. Normally new friends are my favorite people, but recent events have soured me on company. May up another time. Kanja drew black. <laughs> Kanja drew back, looking nervously over her shoulder at Lauren's party. But while, I vouch for them. And I trust you implicitly, my dear. Yet I do not trust them. The smith pulled nervously at her collar. Lauren licked her lips and stepped forth. Trust is not always necessary for business, she said, especially when such business may fill your pockets for many months to come. A long... <clears throat> hmm. A long silence stretched from behind the door. That is a mighty promise. You do not know how deep my pockets are. Yet I know what I have brought to fill them. Another long silence. When Wilde spoke again, Lauren thought she could hear some amusement in his tone. Never let it be said that I do not respect confidence, even when that confidence borders on arrogance. Come in, then, I suppose. They heard a bar sliding. Conjure breathed a sigh of relief and reached out to open the door. No one stood inside. Lauren saw only a steep staircase leading up to the second floor. Where is he? said Lauren. Upstairs, said Conja. Come. She led them up the stairs. The second floor was entirely separate from the first, and a half wall divided part of the back of the room from the front. The place looked as if it had once been well furnished. The chairs and cabinetry were of fine craftsmanship. Fine rugs were on the floor, and Lauren spotted dishes with gold and silver inlay. But the apartment looked as though a disaster had struck it. There were bits of splintered wood on the floor, as though some furniture had been destroyed in a fight that... <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
There were bits of splintered wood on the floor, as though some furniture had been destroyed in a fight and no one had yet tidied up. There were stains on some of the rugs, and while they might be wine, Lauren suspected blood. In a blue winged armchair sat a man. In a blue winged armchair sat a dark man with sharp eyes. He wore a black vest over a long cream colored tunic and dark blue pants that went into high leather boots. His appearance was immaculate, utterly at odds with the state of his dwelling. In his hand was a glass goblet full of wine, which he set down as he rose from the chair to greet them. Lauren thought to herself that that was entirely. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lauren thought to herself that that was entirely unnecessary, since he must have been standing when they arrived, and had only sat so that he could stand up again. His eyes roved across Lauren's little group, studying each one of them with interest. His gaze lingered long on Annis, and he blinked more than once at Lauren's striking green eyes. "'Greetings to all and a good evening to you,' he said, bowing low. As Kanja has no doubt told you, I am known as Wile, or likely you knew that already, for I heard that you have been searching for me. But I do not think I know you, or have heard of you, and you are a bit younger than the friends I am used to meeting. His eyes flicked to Lauren again as he said it. But, but Wile, cried Kanja, what on earth has happened here? She gawked at the destruction all around them. Nothing you should worry your muscular self about, said Wyle. It is a small situation with which I have only recently dealt. I shall have the place in order by tomorrow. Kanja still looked upset, but Lauren cared little for whatever trouble Wyle had had, as long as it had passed. She stepped forwards to speak before Kanja could ask further questions. We are friends and travelers passing through, and our age does not diminish the quality of our goods. We have some items that we wish to sell you if you are interested. They are of the finest quality, and nothing we would want to sell where certain red-clad friends might catch wind of it. Wiles' eyes widened, and the corners of his lips turned down in thought. Of course, of course, he said. Naturally. Well, if we are to do business, then I should don my business garments. A moment, if you would. Excuse me. <clears throat> he retreated to the back section of the room, where the half wall hid him from view. Lauren and Annis gave each other an odd look. Jem looked at Kanja and frowned. Business garments? Some finery of his, no doubt. Kanja gave a little smile. I have seen him in many fine clothes, as well as none at all. From his expression, Lauren thought Jem might be sick. Then they heard the crash of a window from the back of the room. Dark below, growled Lauren. She ran around the half wall. A window in the front of the building had been broken, and Wile was nowhere to be seen. Jam down the stairs, she cried. I will go after him. Lauren ran to the window. Wile was already halfway to the ground. There were tiles and bricks set in the wall. Lauren had thought them a decoration, but now she saw they formed a sort of ladder leading down. An escape route, in case Wile found himself cornered. Lauren admired the precaution. She leaped out the window and took the same route down. Wilde jumped the last two paces to the ground. He landed in a crouch and came up running. But he had not predicted the mystics. Uzo leaped out of the alley, hands grasping. Wilde seized the spearman's arm and flipped him around, then kicked his legs out from under him. Uzo landed hard on his back. But Shiun appeared, driving a fist into Wilde's stomach. He fell to the street, wheezing. Lauren reached the ground a moment later, and Jem appeared just after. Lauren helped Uzo to his feet. He had hit the back of his head when he landed, and he rubbed it ruefully while glaring at the smuggler. Lauren tossed her head towards the back of the building. Bring him back to his hideout, she said. This is not a conversation for the open air. <clears throat> I'm 
going to have to go refresh my coffee here in a minute. <clears throat> yeah, we're several pages away. I'm actually going to go refresh my coffee real quick. Ugh. All right. <clears throat> they took him back to the door leading to the staircase. <clears throat> oh, boy. This is going to be rough, isn't it? They took him back to the door leading to the staircase, but Lauren commanded Shiyun and Uzo to wait again. One of you remain here, and one at the front of the building. I will not let him try the same trick twice, but be ready just in case. In truth, she had no wish for the mystics. <clears throat> oh boy. Can we do this? <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> In truth, she had no wish for the mystics to learn of her mage stones. Uzo and Shiun nodded and went to do as they were bid. Lauren put a hand on Wiles' shoulder. He tried to shake her off, but before he could react, she pulled one hand up behind his shoulder blades and shoved him up the stairs. Be still. You will not escape me a second time, but I have no wish to hurt you. You are hurting me now, said Wiles. But to her surprise, his tone was affable. He stopped resisting and walked up the stairs without further trouble. Once they had entered the apartment again, Lauren released him with a shove. Kanja still stood where she had been, eyes wide and head swinging back and forth. I do not understand. What is wrong? A sudden change of heart has come over me, said Weil. I decided, rather abruptly it is true, that I would rather not do business with these new friends. But why? said Kanja, blinking. Wile sighed and rubbed at his temples. Kanja, you are a lovely woman, if too trusting, and a more than possible lover, but you are a terrible judge of people. Your new friends are the king's law. Kanja gasped and took a step back. Her eyes grew panicked, and she seemed as if she might run. He speaks the truth, said Lauren, but you need not fear. Not her, Mayup, said Wile. He took it <clears throat> he shook his head. <clears throat> he shook his head with a sigh. But I hold no illusions for myself. What a tragedy. I'm too pretty and too clever to die under the knives of mystics, and just after ridding myself of another gaggle of troublemakers. 
Jem gave a loud snort. Lauren shot him a glare. You have no reason to fear us, while, nor was that little display of yours necessary, said Lauren. We are not here to kill you nor to put you to the question, but I think I would prefer the rest of our conversation to be conducted in private. If you do not mind... She tossed her head towards Kanja. Wyle stared at her for a moment, and then a slow smile crept across his lips. He went to Kanja and put his hands on her shoulders. Whether she tells the truth or no, neither of us gains anything by your being here, my sweet, he said. Go and take care of yourself. I will see you soon, if I can. Kanja gave Lauren one last uneasy look, but she nodded. Then she pulled in while and kissed him deep and long. Lauren and Annis studiously averted their gazes, and Jem openly made a gagging noise. But the moment passed, and then Kanja left through the apartment's back entrance. Lauren waved a hand. <clears throat> Lauren waved a hand at the staircase. That one hardly did much to guard your presence here. Whatever made you entrust her with the secret? Wyle shrugged. Kanja is a fine woman, as I said, and when someone comes to Bertram looking for those who deal beyond the king's law, they never look twice at a steelsmith. I wonder, in fact, how you found her. How painful it must be to wonder, said Lauren. To her amusement, Wyle very nearly pouted. Painful indeed. The pout turned into the same curious smile she had seen earlier. But now we have wasted enough time on, shall we call them pleasantries? I wish to hear the real reason you sought me. Servants of the king's law seeking to deal with a man like me. <laughs> I begin to think you may be even better friends than I first thought. We may be, said Lauren. It has come to my knowledge that you deal in certain goods of inestimable price, and because of that we know that you know a great deal about the family Yaren. Wiles' amused look fell away at once. He folded his arms over his chest. I feel my mind changing again. On second thought, or rather third, or is it fourth, I think I would rather not have any dealings with you after all. How unfortunate for you, said Lauren. We have come to the point where your preference matters very little to me. The smuggler's eyes narrowed. How did you come to be here anyway? You seem to know a very great deal about me, but I only know that you are the Nightblade. That took Lauren aback. You know who I am? Wyle shrugged. Rumors are one of the most, no, the most important tool of my trade. Many people whisper about the green-eyed girl in the black cloak. He pointed at her face and then her body. Green eyes, black cloak, and servant of the king's law. You know more about me than you make it sound, said Lauren. Just because I hear rumors do not... <clears throat> Ugh. Okay, we can make it. We can make it to the end of this chapter. We can do this, team. <clears throat> Just because I hear rumors does not mean I rely over much on them, said Weil. Many tales about your obvious lies, like how you escaped a constable's prison with a magic cloak. I wish to learn a truth or two instead. Lauren well remembered Zane's warning. Weil had no love for the wizard, and would not be pleased to find out Lauren was his friend. It does not much matter how I heard of you, she said. Come now, I am at your mercy. Who cares if I know how it came about? Wyle began counting on his fingers. 
Was it Torbrook who told you? He has never forgiven me for that mess with the Kalentin ship. Or may up that girl Jessa. She has caused me more than a fair share of troubles, and all because of a little misunderstanding over Hemlock. Ah, I have it. It was that idiot of idiots, Rob. If I hear one more word from him about that den of lovers... Stop, said Lauren. If it will seize your prattling, I will tell you. I learned of you from Zane of the family Foradar. Wiles' already annoyed expression turned to dismay. Zane! Sky above, a trio of misfortunes has befallen me at once. A girl made out of rumors sent by one of the worst investments I ever made on some business concerning the Yerens. No, that is three reasons for me to have nothing to do with... with whatever this is, and any of the reasons would be good enough on its own. Lauren felt herself at somewhat of a loss. The man clearly wanted nothing to do with her, and whenever she tried to argue with him, he only talked circles around her. But in the moment's silence, Annis stepped forwards. "'You need not have any dealings with the family Yaren at all,' said Annis. "'We only wish to know what they are up to. A small group of Yarens have been crisscrossing their way across Dorsey. We need to find them. Surely you must know something.' While eyed her. How much do you know about the family Yarin? <clears throat> Yarn. Yarn. Oh, stretchy stretch. <clears throat> How much do you know about the family Yarin exactly? Annis's cheeks darkened for a moment. Quite enough. Oh? said Weil. I wonder. I wonder if you know what they do to anyone who attempts to interfere with their trade. No, not even interfere, but just to skim a small bit on the side. I have had friends who attracted their attention. Have had, I say, for none of them still live. And they were not quick in dying. The Yerens saw to that. No, I do not imagine you know very much about the Yerens at all, or you would not pursue them in the first place. Annis smiled, though the expression was devoid of humor and held only a clear threat. Lauren shuddered at how closely she remem remembered. <laughs> I remember that remark. <clears throat> Lauren shuddered at how closely we're so close to the end. We can do it if we try. Lauren shuddered at how closely she resembled Damaris in that moment. You guess wrong. I myself am of the family Yaren. You have the honor of addressing Annis, daughter of Damaris. Wiles' mouth opened at once, as if to reply by reflex, but once he heard Annis's words, his voice died in his throat. His skin went several for fertnifing. His skin went several shades paler. At last he choked out, I... I had not heard that you still traveled with the Nightblade. Yet you can see that I do, said Annis. And I would ever so much appreciate your help. But of course, if you will not give it, I shall be forced to send a letter to my darling mother. You? Weil swallowed hard. I know you would not. They say you have sundered yourself from her. There are precious few rumors about you, but they all agree on that. If so, they speak the truth, said Annis, and certainly we are on no friendly terms. Yet whatever opinion she holds of me, my mother, and in fact all my kin, would be most interested to learn the name of a man dealing in mage stones, and just where in Bertram he might be found. Weil stared at her for a long, silent moment. Then his gaze rose to Lauren, and he flashed her a wide smile. The Nightblade of the High King, he said, giving her a deep bow. 
I am most pleased to make your acquaintance. It will, of course, be my pleasure to serve you. And that is that on that. Woof. That was hard to get through. Holy shit. That's weird. Okay. That is enough recording for today.
a little rough, honestly. My voice was was crapping out pretty hard at the end, uh, beep end, Erica. Um, so we're we're switching over to QCing uh, the Hellskin audiobook. Yeah, <clears throat> I was saying earlier, uh, I think that if I just stick to it every day, you know, keep keep recording as often as I can every day, um, it'll get back in the habit because I had I had a whole sleep thing happen to me like a couple of weeks ago that made it really hard. Like, anyway, I just had like a really rough week. And I have clearly not fully recovered. Chapter 10 I quickly learned the names of the rest of my squadron. But now, these many years later, I cannot remember all of them. That is the way of things, I fear, and the same is true for all the mercenary companies with which I ever fought. Memory is fickle. Unless a particular story stitched one of my companions tightly in my mind, I forgot them eventually. Mag and I launched into training our soldiers with great vigor. We set them to the drills we had done in the Upangan Blade. I forgot them eventually. Mag and I launched into training our soldiers with great vigor. With, with with great Mag and I launched into training our soldiers with great vigor. We set them to the drills we had done in the Upangan Blades. Victon had been an excellent officer, quickly able to turn even the greenest warriors into passable fighters. And the greenest warriors seemed to be what Kuhn had given us. Both Mag and I struggled to maintain hope through our dismay. Halan was the only person in either of our units with any experience in a proper fighting force. I could not tell if Kuhn had stacked the deck against our success, or if our soldiers were representative of the entire army. Something told me it was a combination of the two. From the start, I began to get a feel for the personalities of those in my squadron. Jian, for example, had a bit of a nasty streak and a frightful temperament. You shoot for the head too often, I told her once. Of course you will kill a foe if you strike them between the eyes, but it is a much smaller target. The chest is a more reliable hit, and it will remove your enemy from the fight just as quickly. A savage twist came to her mouth, and I could not quite have called it a smile. That seems sensible. But what about gut shots, then? I have heard those are likely to kill and painfully. I would not mind letting those dark damned traitors suffer before ending them. I frowned. They are painful, that is true, but still not as good as the chest. If you shoot for the gut and your aim is low, you are likely to strike the belt or buckle. That may keep your shot from bringing them down. And if you are off by a wider margin, your arrow might pass between the legs and miss. We aim for the chest because it is the largest target, with the widest margin for error. Again she nodded, and she did not seem to notice my unease. That is sensible as well. The chest it is, then. She showed her teeth for a moment and pushed back her rakish hair. And then if I miss, I may be fortunate and hit the gut after all. 
Chalsaku was next to her in the line, and his locks swayed as he turned to glower down at her. Far down, for she was less than eight hands tall. Our purpose is not savagery, he said. We are here to save the kingdom, not become torturers. Jian turned to face him. I'm here to punish traitors, not to coddle them. Enough from both of you, I snapped. Turn your ire into action. Any more arguing and you shall be running laps around the training grounds. Yes, sir, grated Chao Saku. I am not afraid of running, muttered Jian. But she turned her attention back to the practice targets, and Chao Saku did the same. Halan had a more challenging time with his drills at first. I stepped up behind him on that first day and watched as two of his shots whizzed by the dummy. Rubbish, he muttered, his beard twitching. Then he noticed me standing there and lowered his bow, straightening up. Sir, what can I do for you? I'm only observing, I told him. You have good form. How long has it been since you practiced? Long enough that when last I did, my eyes still worked, he groused. Form's easy enough. It's getting the target sighted that's tripping me up. Why do you not have spectacles? I said. Taitu may not be a great city, but surely there is a glass weaver in town. Sure enough there is, he said with a nod. Just never needed them much, I suppose. I've been a woodsman for years now, and I can see plenty well enough to bring down a tree. And a simple living, so I never had much in the way of extra coin to pay for glass. Well, you shall need them if you were to fulfill your duty now, I said. And the coin for it can come from the mystics. I will speak with two this evening and arrange it. Halan looked pleasantly surprised, and he bowed, his beard pushing into his chest. Well, my thanks to you then, sir, he grunted. Spectacles on my ugly old face. Who'd have guessed it? It was not long before I came to treat Halan as my unofficial second-in-command. He had a good head on his shoulders, and he could make peace if tensions rose among the squadron, and particularly with Chausaku and Jian. When I relayed an order through him, my soldiers obeyed as if it had come straight from my mouth. I tried not to favor him too heavily, of course, for I feared the others might grow jealous. But in fact, I think it rather endeared me to them. They seemed to believe that if I relied on Halan, I must be someone of sound judgment. But while I did my duty in training my archers, I was much more concerned with mag sword fighters. Kuhn's test would be combat in the ring, not a test of archery, and we had to pass. On the third day of our training, two came by for inspection. I saw him heading for Mag's squadron, and I turned to Halan. Halan, I'm going to speak with the lieutenant, I told him. If you need me, send someone to fetch me. Yes, sir, he said with a nod, and knocked another arrow. I went running after two and reached him just before he reached Mag's unit. He saw me coming and gave a... Okay, Erica, have a great day. I went running after two and reached him just before he reached Mag's unit. He saw me coming and gave a nod without asking why I was there. I suspect he could guess. Mag was standing at the edge of a ring, and two men were training in the middle of it. She looked up as two and I approached, and she snapped off a salute to him. Sir? Sergeant, said two. How goes the training? Are you in need of anything? I would enjoy more time to work with them and at least one fighter who had seen action before, said Mag. But since I do not think those are things you can provide, I will not request them of you. Two nodded. Fair enough. Sad to say we are all somewhat green here. I myself have never seen combat on the field. The two of you may be the most experienced fighters in the whole force. He pointed at the two men in the ring behind Mag. Who are these? Mag pointed to the younger combatant. He was a strong man, wearing a sleeveless shirt that left his bronzed arms glistening. His black hair was cropped close and dripping with sweat. As I watched, he swiped the sweat away, never taking his eyes from his foe. That is Debo, said Mag. His opponent is Jie. 
They are among the better specimens in my squadron. I have tried to pair each fighter up with someone close to them in skill so that all of them get the most benefit from each training session. Debu lunged, swinging a horizontal strike. Jie got his shield up, but Debu managed to catch the edge of it. Jie's shield arm flew wide. As he stumbled back, Debu pressed forwards. His blade circled around and up towards Jie's face. I tensed, but Debu controlled the swipe. It stopped just short of Jie's eye. Jie recoiled and his foot came down in a puddle of slushy snow. Jie recoiled and... Jie recoiled and his foot came down in a puddle of slushy snow. While he was off balance, Debu kicked his gut. Jie fell, his sword and shield clattering from his hands. Debu stepped up and pointed his blade at the larger man's face. Good, called Mag. Reset and do it again. Jie, you must study your battlefield always. Know where your footing is safe and where it is precarious. Mud can win a fight faster than skill. Yes, sir, said Jie. He reached out a hand and Debu helped pull him to his feet. But when Debu looked over to see the three of us there watching him, including two, he suddenly seemed embarrassed. His bronzed face flushed and he quickly turned away. Two cleared his throat. That one does not like performing, he said, stroking his goatee. Yet he focused well enough during the fight. Who else do you count among your best? Mag arched an eyebrow and motioned for two and me to follow her. I have one of particular note. Her name is Lee. She has never fought in a real battle before, but her mother was a soldier in King Jun's army, and she taught Lee many forms. Between that and the girl's natural talent, Lee certainly has the greatest skill of anyone in my squadron. I expect to rely on her to help me teach the rest of them. I could see at once that Mag spoke true. Lee was paired up with another woman, and both of them were light of build but wiry. Yet Lee was far more quick and nimble on her feet than her opponent, darting back and forth like a serpent. First her blade was above, then below, and then sweeping in from the side. It was all her opponent could do to keep the sword away from her padded armor, and she could not do so forever. With the speed of liquid thunder, Lee spun around her foe's clumsy strike. The flat of her blade crashed into the small of the other woman's back. She fell face down in the dirt. Immediately... All right, Cameron, have a good one. Catch you next time. Immediately, Lee straightened, heaved a deep breath, and sheathed her sword. A good strike, called two. Both women snapped around to look at him. But you relented the moment you had an advantage. You cannot do the same thing in a real fight. Lee's eyes widened, and she bowed. Of course, sir. It is just... Well, I already felled her. And a felled enemy can rise once more if you do not finish them, said Mag. Again, and this time do not pull back until the fight is over. She waved at the two of them to begin, and then turned to confer with two and me. She moves like you, Mag, I told her. Mag looked somewhat miffed. She is quick enough on her feet, I suppose. Well, everything seems to be in order, said Two. Better than in order, in fact. I still do not entirely understand why the captain made this wager with you, but I find myself hoping you will win. As do we, sir, I said. Do you have any advice for us, any tips that might secure a victory? Two shrugged. I have no hidden information, if that is what you mean. The terms are rather clear, and the captain seems confident you shall not beat him. I can do little more than encourage you to do your best, and hope. I sighed. Well, if that is the best we can do, then we shall do it. Thank you, Lieutenant. Two nodded and left us. I looked to Mag. What do you think? Do we have a chance? 
Mag looked at Lee, who was again trading blows with her opponent in the ring. A chance? Mayup, ask me again in a few more days.
quick restroom. Be right back. Chapter 11 But of course, Mag and I were not the only ones joining together with allies. To the north of us, close to the Feldemarian border, Rogan had encamped with many of his soldiers. As I have mentioned, they were the ones raiding into Feldemar. They crossed the border in Dorshan uniforms, attacking farms and the caravans of lesser merchant families. 
In this way, they had been fomenting discord between the two kingdoms and drawing King Jun's attention to the area. This distracted Jun from the coup that Wo Jin had been planning under his very nose. Now that open war had broken out in the kingdom, however, Rogan's strategy would change radically. And it was while he was concocting the... Rogan's strategy would change radically. his very nose. Distracted Jun from the coup that Wo Jin had been planning under his very nose. Wojin had been planning under his very nose. Now that open war had broken out in the kingdom, however, Wojin's strategy would change radically. Not Wojin's strategy. Distracted <clears throat> Jun from the coup that Wojin had been planning under his very nose. had been planning under his very nose. Now that open war had broken out in the kingdom, however, Rogan's strategy would change radically. And it was while he was concocting these plans that Kaita found him at last. Rogan stepped out of his broad tent and into the open air, walking through the center of the camp. All around him, shades stopped in their tracks and saluted, hands over their fists. He nodded to each, giving them a stern smile that warmed their hearts. But as he neared the center of the camp, it seemed as if a thought struck him. His steps faltered, slowed, and then stopped. Though no one else had heard anything, Rogan tilted his head back to look into the sky, and the faint smile on his lips fell away. A raven swooped out of the gray clouds to land on the dirt before him. Some shades looked on curiously, and then their eyes bugged with surprise as Kaita emerged from the bird's form. But Rogan looked as if he had expected her. Kaita, he said, warm, welcoming, grief-stricken. Brother, said Kaita through a raspy throat. She had been ragged five days ago when she received Rogan's summons, 
She looked worse now. Her clothes were new, but she was dirty and wasted and gaunt beyond what Rogan had ever seen of her. Still, she tried to stand tall, her head up and her shoulders back. But it was a poor showing, and her limbs shook with the effort of attempting it. Rogan saw it in her eyes, and he motioned her back towards his tent. Kaita followed him without a word. They passed through the camp quickly, and it was all Kaita could do to ignore the stares of the other shades. Rogan pulled back the flap of his tent, letting Kaita step through first. He had barely followed her in before Kaita broke. Her face twisted with pain as tears etched burning lines down her face. She paced to the back of the tent and whirled, walking back up to Rogan and glaring up into his face. Weeks, she said, managing to keep her voice down so that those outside could not hear her fury. Weeks I have been searching for you. I went to every encampment I knew of, every stronghold where our siblings have gathered in strength. No one knew where you were, and that is not like you. No one knew how to send you a message, and that is not like you. You left me alone. Alone in the wilderness, with two people hungry for my death, and after you promised. Her voice broke, and she turned from him. Rogan laid a hand on her shoulder from behind, but she jerked away. Do not touch me. You were never alone, said Rogan softly. I have heard many reports of your long journey. In Lan Shui, and then Opara, and then Kahwanga, you were with our siblings always. But I had no one I cared about, snapped Kaita. Not after Delic died in Lan Shui. I did not have Tagata, or you, or father. Rogan's face grew stony. Kaita knew he wished to admonish her, to tell her that she should care about all the shades as if they were family. But he held the words back. Mayup he knew that was not what she needed to hear. We made a plan together, Kaita, he said. And we agreed upon it in Northwood, before you set out on your long road. That plan never satisfied me, and you know it. And do you think I was happy with it? Do you think I enjoyed making the promises I did? I would rather have had you by my side all this long while. But Mag and Alburn were more important to you, and I knew that, and so I let you go on your own way. That is the nature of compromise, Kaita, of being part of a family. You and I both thought you had a hope in Northwood, and then in Kahwanga. Kaita's chin trembled as she looked up at him. Yes, she had thought she had a hope. Better than a hope. How could she have foreseen that Mag would be able to defeat her lion form? How could she have predicted that Mag would find a way to survive even the trolls? They were monsters of campfire legend. But her plans had failed her, just as her strength had failed her every time she and Mag came to blows. She could not win, no matter what she did. Dark below, she could not even find a way to kill me, and I was no warrior of legend. Even my sister Dietra had survived Kaita's attempts to kill her. The seed of doubt had already rooted in Kaita's mind. Now, for the first time, it ensnared her own idea of herself, becoming a corruption that threatened to destroy the last shreds of her conviction. Yet Kaita was not the sort of person to accept responsibility when she could instead cast blame, and so her expression went from lost to furious once more, and again she stepped towards Rogan. You never gave me the chance I wanted, she hissed. I told you from the beginning what I need, what I knew I would require in the end. Now I have spent months in useless flight, and you have lost scores of your precious siblings. They have exposed our plans in two kingdoms, all because you would not listen to me until it was too late. That is why I demanded your promise, because I knew all along what it would come to in the end, even if you were too foolish to see it. She stopped suddenly, fearing she had gone too far. But no anger came into Rogan's eyes, only a more profound sadness. 
and Kaita wondered if he knew all the unspoken thoughts that had flitted through her head before she finally lashed out. I wanted to give you a chance to change, to learn why you must change, he said quietly. Since before we met, you have tried to do everything alone. You wish to rely only on yourself, to have so much power that no one can challenge you. Once you were loyal to a family and they betrayed you. You have feared to rely on others ever since. But those you hunt, Mag and especially Alburn, they know the value of friendship, of companions on whom they can depend. They know what it is to fight as part of something greater than themselves, to serve without the desire of personal advantage. I have served the Shades loyally, said Kaita, a note of desperation in her voice. And you know I love you for it, said Rogan. And I know you love me and some other few of our number. But I am no fool, Kaita. Your own goals have always come first. The moment you saw your opportunity, you abandoned everything to pursue what you had long desired. You would break the world to achieve your ends, and you would cast all of us aside to do it. That is why your foes defeat you, Kaita, over and over again. And you will never win until you come to your senses. You must tear down your walls. I cannot do it for you. But I can tell you that leaving yourself open to betrayal is better than living your life alone. Silent sobs began to rack her body long before he finished. In one corner of his large tent was a small desk and chair, and she stumbled over to sit. Rogan knelt beside her, wrapping her shoulders in his massive, powerful hands, and he let her cry. In time she turned and buried her face in his tunic, and he held her like the sister she was to him. But when at last her tears subsided and her fists loosened their desperate grip on his clothes, she looked up at him. Her eyes were clear once more, and there was a hunger in them. I hear you, brother, said Kaita. I am ready to join the cause with my whole heart, and I am ready to accept the help I know I can find nowhere else, the help that our father promised. Rogan's heart broke for he knew that she had not truly understood him. And for a moment he felt the temptation to refuse her. But he could not. He had made a promise, not only to Kaita, but to the Lord. And though he could not see as far as his father, he knew that he must keep faith with both of them if the Shades were to achieve their ends, even if it came at the cost of Kaita's life. Gently he pulled her hands from his tunic, and then he went to the foot of his bedroll. He had a small chest there, which he opened now using the silver key from his belt. Out of the chest he pulled a small packet wrapped in brown cloth. Kaita's eyes lit at once. You have them with you now? I always do, he said, and recently in particular... I have ensured I had an extra store on hand, for I knew you would come to claim them. I have never forgotten you. Even when I could not see you, you must believe me. You were never out of my mind, and I never abandoned you. Kaita nodded, but it was an absent-minded gesture, for her eyes were fixed on the stones. Again Rogan sighed, and he came over to place the packet in her hand. They are yours, he said, as I promised. But now I must demand a promise from you in turn. Her eyes flashed as she looked up at him. And what is that? You must use them at the right time, said Rogan. Do not plunge after Mag or Alburn into the middle of a host of foes. You may kill them if you do. But even with the stones, you will not escape alive. Draw them out first. Use the mage stones when they are alone, isolated, even from each other if you can manage it. Strike only when you are certain of survival. 
Do not throw your life away trying to end theirs. For a moment she hesitated, and Rogan feared she would refuse. He had no right to demand this of her, not really. Already he had sworn to give her the stones, without this condition. But as she looked up at him, Rogan saw understanding in her eyes, as well as compassion. She stood from the chair and stepped forwards, laying her head against his chest, his thick arms wrapped around her shoulders. I promise, she said, for I know you ask out of kindness and concern. And I will make another promise. I vow to live up to the faith you have shown in me, and that I know Father still has for me. And he will until the end, Rogan murmured. His voice was thick with grief, but he knew she would mistake it for reverence. Now go. Tagata leads the greater part of our forces west. Join her there, and you will soon have the opportunity you seek. Kaita looked up at him in wonder. Albert and Mag will be there? But I thought they were to the south, closer to the Birchwood. Despite the pain in his heart, he smiled down at her. They will meet Tagata, and soon. She lifted a hand and placed it against his cheek. Thank you, brother, she whispered. I will not fail you, and I will see you soon. Quickly she left the tent. In a moment, Rogan heard the flapping of wings as a raven took to the air. At last he let his tears come, slow and silent as they worked their way through the lines of his face. Kaita had given him her promise, for she thought it came from his love for her. But even that promise had been mandated by the Lord. Another one bites the dust. <sighs> Ugh.
All right, one more chapter before we end off for the day. Chapter 12 After the first five days of training, Mag and I took stock of our situation. We were sitting apart from our squadrons, sharing a meal around a campfire. Dryleaf was with us, and Oku had curled up at my feet. The day's rain had faded to a mere drizzle. Our breath misted in the air, dissipating quickly, and our feet squished upon the slushy ground. I think you should present Lee for Kuhn's test, I said. I have seen her against the others. No one can match her speed, and few even come close. Mag pursed her lips, but after a moment she shook her head. I do not think so. She has the skill, but something is missing inside her. Her attention wanders as often as her gaze. Nimble feet and quick hands are all well and good, but a true warrior needs something more. I frowned and paused in feeding Oku a scrap. What more do you think she needs? A killer instinct, said Mag. She never presses the fight hard enough, even when she has an advantage, and when she is on her back foot she all but gives up. She knows her foe is not really trying to harm her and it makes her complacent. No matter how many times I tell her to take things more seriously, she does not muster the fire she needs to truly crush her foe. Oku had been waiting No matter how many times I tell her to take things more seriously, she does not muster the fire she needs to truly crush her foe. Oku had been waiting patiently for me to finish handing him the bit of gristle I had pulled out of my bowl. I fed it to him and scratched him behind the ears. That is may up a good thing while that foe is another trainee, I said, but I see your point. Let us hope she can summon that instinct upon the battlefield and survive such a test. But who then gives us the best chance? Mag was silent for a moment, and then she gave a slow nod as if answering a question in her mind. Debu, she said, if anyone can secure our position with the mystics, I think it will be him. Dryleaf's bushy eyebrows shot up. Debu, he seems a good man from the brief conversations we have had, yet I thought he had not touched a blade until just under a month ago. That is true, said Mag. Yet now he nearly matches Lee's skill. I noticed on the second day that two seemed to favor him, and soon I saw one reason why. I think if I focus most of my efforts on him, he will surpass Lee. He certainly has better instincts. Though he is only training, he never lets up until his opponent is defeated. A small smile crossed her lips. Or until he is defeated. After all, I sometimes train with him personally. I chuckled. There is the modesty I have missed in you. She scoffed, as if such a malady has ever plagued me. How have things been with you, Dryleaf? I said. You have been often in Taitu, and also wandering around the army's encampment. Have you learned anything interesting? Nothing I think would be especially helpful, said Dryleaf. I am making more progress in the town than in the camp, but there is less information there than here. 
My best sources are at a house of the Guild of Lovers. They are always glad to welcome a skillfully told story or a good singing voice. And, of course, many within Kuhn's army visit them often, including some of the mystics. But you know lovers. Not particularly, said Mag, smirking. I chuckled. They are reticent with their client's information is what he means, I said. And well, they should be. Indeed, said Dryleaf. They will tell me only harmless little items, interesting but not especially useful, and with no names attached. Everyone knows Kuhn is training this army to go and fight, but no one knows where, or when, or for what purpose. He could mean to march on the capital, but I do not think so. He does not have enough troops. I agree, I said. I still think our first guess is the best one. He means to pursue the Shades. And that means he is our best chance to find Kaita said Mag. Her bowl was empty and she placed it on the ground beside her as she leaned back on her hands. Oku immediately began to lick it clean. We must win Kun's trial. Let us hope that he does not deliberate overmuch on his choice of a fighter. If he thinks the trial will be easy and that any of his mystics can defeat our champion, he may carelessly choose someone Dibu can overcome. I worried about can overcome. I worried about Kuhn more and more as the days went on, however. He had begun to come around our part of the camp often, looking in on us as we trained our squadrons. He never failed to be exceedingly polite, and I never saw his broad smile falter. How goes the training? he would ask, and I would grit my teeth and reply, Excellent, Captain. You can see for yourself how they are improving. And Kuhn would inspect the practice dummies and nod in approval. He would even go to one or another member of my squadron and give them pointers. Notice how Alburn raises his elbow higher than you. That gives his draw more strength, and it shifts the string less when he looses the arrow. Try to match him. Even if he did not wish us to remain in his company, he seemed determined to gain as much benefit as possible from our instruction. Of course, he took even greater interest in Mag sword fighters. He would pace around the edges of her practice rings and call out advice or encouragement as the bouts went on. It made some of the soldiers quite nervous. Lee, in particular, did not at all enjoy his presence, and her attention wandered even more than usual. Once, she almost dropped her sword when Kuhn barked at her to press her attack. I began to understand why Mag did not think Lee was the best choice. Yet Kuhn seemed to have the same opinion that I had held at first. As the days wore on, he focused most of his attention on Lee. He observed her evident skill with the blade and the way she toyed with her opponents rather than finish them off. I hoped he thought she would be our champion and that Dibu would be a surprise. Mag began to guide his thoughts further in that direction. Whenever Kuhn would come by for inspection, Mag would drill Lee personally. She would push the girl to her limits, but not beyond them, making her look as though she could nearly hold her own in the fight. But the moment Kuhn left, Mag would return to Dibu and resume working with him instead. Tu was a constant presence during our drilling, wandering around the rings while he brushed his fingers through his goatee. He oversaw three other squadrons, but he spent an increasing amount of time with us. He would even help our troops practice, and I came to learn that he was a powerful fighter. Though he lacked a substantial build, he was surprisingly strong, impregnable in defense and ferocious when on the attack. Mag requested him to pair up with Dibu whenever he came by, and I could see the boy's skill begin to grow by leaps and bounds. Two knocked him into the slushy ground every time, but Dibu lasted longer and longer against him as days went by. Each time they finished, Two would confer with Mag and me, giving advice on how to prepare Dibu for the test. 
Mag was always grateful for his insight. Though it may sound boastful, I think too was quite intrigued by us. I know certainly that we became friendly in short order. Two tried to maintain an appropriate level of separation and distance, but no more than one would expect from one's superior officer. He was a good sort, but I could tell he placed great faith in military discipline. Though he wanted us to join Kuhn's army, he had no wish to undermine his superior officer. This put him in a difficult position, but he managed it as best he could. For my part, at least, I wanted to help him, and the best way to do that was to succeed in Kuhn's challenge on our own merits. Day by day, we drove ourselves and our troops as hard as we could, but the week seemed to wear away incredibly fast. Every time.
Chapter 11 Chapter 12 Okay. That is it for us on audio today. You know what time it is. Time to get wrecked in Elden Ring. Uh oh. All oh, right. Where even am I? I think I'm trying to recover souls. That's usually where I am when I log into the game. I'm trying to recover a bunch of souls that I recently lost. I think I'm in a tunnel somewhere. I'm in a tu oh, I'm trying to beat this magma worm thing. That's right. And my souls are currently in the room. Here we go. No. This happens every time. Yeah, there I go. 
I fucking hate that lava charge so much. I've beat a harder version of this boss before. I probably just need to give up on getting those souls back. I go. No. I just don't want to get back into a corner. That's the worst. Yeah, that keeps happening. Timing. actually survived. He said, speaking too soon. Yeah. Yeah, this is what happens every time. Oh, hey. See, I don't get that. I don't I don't understand. I don't understand how that yeah. I wasn't in the lava when I got hit, so the hitbox is kinda screwy on that one. Oh Lord.
Oops. No fucking way, are you serious? Can't believe I staggered him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 come on, are you fucking kidding me, look how low his health is, I got one more hit, uh, I got greedy, That was all bad. That was very bad. That was a bad run from beginning to end. <sighs> we'll get him. What do I have inventory-wise? Can I even teleport here? I cannot. But I'm close to the end of the tunnel. Smithing stone fives. Well, it's just gonna, it's just instantly this time. Google. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm gonna just trample you endlessly. When he does the endless trampling like that, I, I, no chance. There's just no way to get away from it that I've discovered yet. He's faster than me. He turns as fast as he wants. It seems totally random.
Okay, okay, okay. Look at that, we dodged it. Wow. I saw that coming and thought I dodged, but clearly I did not. <sighs> okay, that's all right. Mm. Okay, okay. No, not again. What the hell. Okay, okay. You should be done now, right? Right, buddy? We're done with the lava charge? Stamina. Ooh, another charge. You totally whiffed that one, bud. Another charge. You're not whiffing this one, are you? You gonna get me? Oh, what the hell. Stop charging. Okay, good. Whew. Endless charging again? We are, aren't we? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my fucking god, we did it. Dragon Moon Veil? What are these things? <sighs> Katana Int 23. Holy shit. Okay. 
Yeah, that is an int katana, so... Not necessarily my thing. Return to entrance. I don't actually want to return to the entrance because the entrance is way back. I'm gonna go level up. Hoo ha 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 ha. That fucking dragon. Okay. We're fine. That's just fine. Okay, that was interesting. Should I go tackle the academy? What the hell, right? I'm supposed to get in this gate somehow. Cannot proceed without a glintstone key. And I had a glintstone key. Is that it? Say hi to stream. Sure. Did they see my dance moves? These, These are, are my dance, dance moves. moves. <laughs> okay. uh, Melody's boy. gonna come by and say goodbye. Oh, okay. When? This morning is all she said. <laughs> okay. Well, I might be gone to work. Hmm. hmm. Ooh. I'm gonna take the kids out. We're also gonna meet Carol's puppy today. Oh, very cute. Yeah. I'm trying to find this spot on this map. And I can't find it. Oh, wait. It's right there. Hmm. And then you're off all day tomorrow? Yep. Tomorrow is the day. Do you want me to see if the chairs are up far or do you want tonight? Sure. Yeah, let's I find out. I we won't be there. I'll call them from the day. Okay. I'm playing Elden Ring. I've been doing the last uh, last half hour of the stream each day. It's just a little bit of gaming. That's how I'm rewarding myself because I've been back into daily production. So you do like 30 minutes of work, 30 minutes of gaming. I've been up since 5:30. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. How dare you? Give me oh a hard time. Oh, that feels really good. Family friendly, Garrett. Family you friendly. Stop those noises. No, you I don't. Yell, you know. 
Noisias. Noisias. Stop me, I can noisias. Okay. Love you. Love you. Mm. You want me to shut up? No. Shush. Family friendly, Megan. Family friendly. Okay. Last time I rode through this area, I was terrified of absolutely everything. But I'm like... 30 levels higher now. Oh, Jesus. Okay. All right. So maybe there was some value to being terrified. Three. I want to go home. Aww. The sad message. Ooh, look. It's one of those ones where, like, yeah, those aren't going to hold anything particularly valuable, I don't think. Uh, 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 okay. Are we, are we about to do this? Are we about to fight a dragon for the first time? That's probably a terrible idea, right? Right? Yeah. Oh, he sees me. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> 
Oh boy. <laughs> Instant dragon one shot. We love to see it. Ooh. Sneaky sneak here. Okay, so I got the key. I'll admit, part of me wants to fight this guy. At least give it a shot, right? Okay. <laughs> that was pretty cool. I mean, I've got no chance, right? Yeah. Motherfucker can fly. Yeah, your stomp is better than my stomp, for sure. Where the hell... Did I make him run away? No, he just leashed back, right? Oops. Not what was intended.
Yeah, okay. All right, let's give this up. <laughs> I, there's no way. <laughs> I'm going to need to power up significantly. Plus, I got the key that I needed, so... I passed the seal and then I got to end off for the day. Oh. Well, that was easy. Watch, it throws me right into a boss fight. <laughs> okay. Ooh, damn. That's nice. Alright, we explore... Oh, uh, I guess we touch the side of grace, and then we explore next time. We'll be back tomorrow morning with another early stream. Let's throw a little raid someone's way. Who is streaming? Let's read Ray. This time we will spell the channel name correctly, I believe. Unless we do what we did again last time. Excellent. Okay, yeah, we'll throw a raid over to Raym Music. Say hi to her for me. Looks like she's working on some Music, live music right now. I'm just... um, yeah, and I will be back for another writing uh, slash uh, slash whatever stream tomorrow morning. Uh, thanks for coming by and hanging out. Cameron, Erica, Nix, everybody else who showed up. Uh, we will continue chunking through these audiobooks tomorrow. Catch you all then. Bye.
I'm jealous of the wind that ripples through.